One, two.
Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you. Oh, thank you. That's, that's better. Uh, we just want to welcome everyone to Seventh Day Adventist Church here in Edry. And especially for our members who are joining online. Good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. We're going to start our song service this morning. And the first song we are singing is Joy By and By. this morning there will be church business meeting on the uh, second day of December and it's going to be that's on a Sabbath day but it's going to be in the evening so I think the sunset for that day will be around like 4 30 so we're going to be having uh, Vespers together as, as a church and then we switch into the uh, business meeting on that day. Please mark your calendar. 
every baptized member of Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Edrie is expected to attend this important meeting because we, we just want to have one agenda, and that is concerning our potluck. How do we want to plan it going forward? So please, uh, mark your calendar so that you can be part of this meeting on December 2nd. Also, we just want to announce to us that uh, Sister Mary has just been moved to Bethany Care here in Edry, and she welcomes visitors. So if you have the time, she would love to see you. You know Sister Mary, right? Yes. You do? Yes. Okay, so if you know Sister Mary, you know she wants visitors. All right. So, and also let us continue to pray for her. We know that she's aged already, and, uh, but she's still going. So we need to pray for her, for God's strength, uh, for her and the entire family as well. Okay. And now we're going to switch to our <clears throat> offering. Our offering today is going to be towards the annual sacrifice for global mission. And it will be good if we can give generously towards this mission, just to help people globally uh, as a church. Uh, I will invite the deacons to come forward. Yes. All right. So let us pray on the offering. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the many blessings over us. Thank you for your provision. And so out of all of these, we have brought today for us to be able to give towards your work. Father, we pray that you bless these monies that we're going to be given. And also bless each and every one of us. There are so many people who are looking for job, those who are looking to change their job, Lord, we pray that you provide the way out. Bless your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While that is going on, we're going to continue with our song service. I am a child of the King. I'm a child of the king, 
a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. A tent or a cottage, oh why should I care? The building of palace for me over there. No hands are from all, yet still may I sing. All glory to God, I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing, I saw one weary. I saw one weary. Okay, uh, sorry about that. There's a little mix-up. All right, so we're going to go to our opening song. Shall we all rise as we sing Marvelous Grace? You may be seated. We have a few prayers uh, requests or prayer points this morning. 
And the first one is going to be a prayer of thanks. You know, I spoke with uh, my sister this morning, uh, Sister Erin. Uh, she's one of our AV team. And before our surgery, sis, uh, she said to me, uh, hopefully by God's grace, I will be able to come back in January. So put me off of the roster for now, and then we see how things go. So this morning I spoke with her and she said, you know, I was actually thinking, maybe I can actually resume in December. You know, I, I'm so grateful to God. And on our behalf, I want to say thank you to all of you for praying for Sister Erin. We still continue to pray for her. Don't forget, please. And uh, so she will be back. Uh, not coming to church, you understand what I mean? She will be back on duty in December. Yes. Thank you. Also, we'll continue to remember our brother, uh, Jake, a member of the AV team too, uh, who is never tired of doing the work of God. But this time, it needs the prayer of uh, God's people for strength. We'll continue to pray for Sister Mary as well, as well as Brother Les. Uh, he did a surgery, I believe, yesterday. Uh, let us just pray for him for quick recovery. Also, I want to believe that we know what today stands for. All right. So, uh, if you can just mute the piano for a little bit where we have just a one minute moment of silence. May the soul of the departed rest in perfect peace. I want us to know that we have, we may have in our midst people whose families have served in the military or they're part of the fallen heroes of the past. We are where we are today as a nation because of the sacrifice of so many in the past. So that we don't forget that some people fought for the freedom that we are all enjoying today. So wherever possible, let us kneel together as we pray. Our Father who lives on high, we want to thank you this morning for bringing us together. Thank you for your grace over each and every one of us. Thank you for life. Thank you for means of livelihood. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your providence every day. We're grateful to you because it is not because we merit any of these good things that you have done, but just because of your grace. And we are not taking this for granted. We just want to say thank you. Father, we acknowledge ourselves as sinner this morning. And I want to pray, Lord, that you please forgive us all our shortcomings and have mercy on us. We thank you for bringing us together to worship. Thank you for the freedom that we have in this nation to be able to congregate and call upon your name. Thank you. And Father, this morning we want to thank you for healing mercies over our members. Thank you for successful surgeries. Thank you for recovery. Lord, we are grateful. And we just want to pray, Lord, that for those who have healed, may you please perfect their healing. And for those who are still looking up to you for healing, for strength, Father, please look down from on high and heal them. Lord, in a special way, we want to commit Brother Les to your hand. And we pray for speedy recovery for him, O oh God. We pray, Father, that you touch him with your hand of healing. We thank you for Brother Jake. And Father, we pray that you continue to grant him strength. Every day that he, he comes out, 
it goes, Lord, we are praying that your, your, your peace that passeth all human understanding will follow him. Thank you for Sister Erin. Thank you for the strength you have given to her. Lord, we just pray you continue to give her this healing and Lord, make it permanent in our life, oh God. For those who may be sick, one way or the other, and have this unspoken request, Father, Lord, please visit them in a special way. Father, today is the Remembrance Day where we pause a little while to remember those who fought for our freedom. Father, many of us here may be family with such, and we are praying for your consolation. We are praying for your comfort, O oh God. And Father, we pray that for those who are still uh, serving one way or the other today to protect this country, may you strengthen them, Heavenly Father, and help each and every one of us. All over the world, Father, there is war and rumors of war. Father, let your kingdom come. We need your peace, oh God. We need that rest that only comes from you. Please, Lord, let your kingdom come. Bless us as we continue in our worship today. Bless Pastor Rod as he delivered the message that you have sent through him. Bless your church at the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so it's a children's story and Sister Jasmine is going to be presenting our children's story today. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, children. Happy Sabbath. We're so happy to see you. Do you know that you brighten our church? It is so good to see each of, each of you here. When I'm not giving the story and I see all these children, I feel so blessed. Can the church say amen? Amen. amen. I have a special story for you today, and it's a true story. I want, um, can you please put the first slide for me? Who can tell me what type of car this is? It's okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. A very old one. <laughs> yes, it is a very old one. One more, okay? Jeep? No, it's not a Jeep. It's, what did you say, I'm sorry? It's a Ford. It's what? It, indeed, it is. It is a Model T Ford. Um, this car was invented in the early 1900s. And um, it was created by the Ford Motor Company. It was around the time my grandfather was a young boy. He probably got to ride in one of these cars. The story I'm going to tell you is true. There once was a man that purchased one of these cars. And he was so proud of his car. And um, one day, unfortunately, his car broke down, and he was very sad. So he parked his car in his driveway, and he opened up the hood, and he started working on his car, and he worked, and he probably touched the muffler, the battery, and nothing seemed to fix his car, nothing. He worked all day. When he was just about to give up, can you put up the picture of the, the next slide? When he was just about to give up on fixing his car, a car drove up, parked right in front of his driveway, and an elegant man dressed in a suit asked him if he could help him fix his car. And this gentleman, we'll call Tim, he said, sure, I've been working on my car all day and I can't get it fixed. And this gentleman went under the hood of the car 
and he took a little bit, let's just say like about five minutes, and he fixed the car immediately. And Tim was bewildered by this, and he said, I've spent all day trying to fix my car, and you come in, and in five minutes, you have the car fixed. How can you do this? And this elegant man said, I am Henry Ford. I am the creator of this car. I know each part and how it works and how it functions. Can you put up the next slide? This is Henry Ford. And you know what? I love this story because it reminds me that you and I have a creator. Can you put up the next slide for me? This is our creator. And he made us fearfully and wonderfully made. And he knows each part of us. He knows when we hurt physically. He knows when our feelings are hurt. He knows when we're frustrated, when we're mad. And you know what? You can go to your creator because he knows how you function. He made every part of you. I want Victoria to read this Bible verse. Tell me where it's at. Go ahead. Psalm 139 verses 13 and 14. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's room. I will praise you because I have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. So he created you and he knitted you carefully in your mother's womb. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So whenever you need him, whenever you don't feel right, go to your creator. Who wants to pray today? Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us as we go back to our seats and help the pastor to uh, give him wisdom and help him to, to do good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. You can go back to your seats. Thank you for that beautiful uh, story. Before the Bible reading, can we just have a quick uh, word of prayer for one of our members that uh, I'm just made aware had uh, one of his fingers uh, caught just while he was walking in, the, in his garage. And I mean, I can mention his name, uh, Larry. And we know for those of us who come early for Sabbath school lesson, you know when Larry is there, you, you, know, you always know that he's around. Yeah, and uh, so I think it is important that we, we pray for him. He's not feeling good at all this morning, as I'm told. So let us bow down our heads as we pray. Lord, we thank you again this morning. You are the healer from heaven. And so, Father, we want to commit Larry to your hand. We pray, Lord, for healing mercies, that you will look down, Father in heaven, and heal him. Touch him, Heavenly Father, wherever the pain is at this time. May you, O oh Lord, please touch him. And let him experience your peace, that Pastor told him an understanding. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, for our Bible reading this morning, Emari is going to be uh, reading the Bible. And after that, we'll be... Uh, Brother Tashley for our special song, after which Pastor Rod will come up with a sermon for today. Um, today's scripture reading will be taken in Second Peter three, no, eight and nine, I think. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one today. The Lord will not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but, it, but is long-suffering long -suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, 
but all that should come to repentance. Good morning, church. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Let me see those smiles. God is good, amen? amen. All the time. <coughs> um, someone told m- me about his mom, and his mom said that every marriage has a test. And I'm going to extend that and say not just marriages, but Every person must face the test. And just like Job, we should learn through our test to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. i 
church. Amen. So great to see everybody here today. Praise God for his church. Praise God for his goodness and his grace in our lives. And praise God for the gifts that he brings us, uh, like music. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing music with us today. You probably don't know, but I'm actually going to preach on the story of Job today. So what a perfect fitting for that. Thank you very much. Um, I want to... Uh, First of all, just uh, say thank you for on Les's behalf. Uh, Les sent me an email this morning. He said so far his recovery is going very well. He had his surgery yesterday and he um, is uh, doing well. And he would like to thank the church for praying for him. He is watching right now online. So he is expressing his uh, appreciation for your prayers and your support. And I'd like to say thank you to our children's ministries department. Wasn't that a fantastic Sabbath last week? You guys were so blessed I wasn't here, but uh, I watched some of it online. We had some audio problems online last Sabbath, but I was able to see some of it. And then I was given the video of Gianna's sermon, and uh, she did a fantastic job. Thank you so much, Gianna. You need to know that when Gianna and I were doing Bible studies together, she actually came up to me and said, I'd like to preach. So it was her idea to actually do the sermon, and what a fantastic job she did. We really appreciate her, and all of our children are such a blessing to us. Our children represent hope, don't they? Hope in the next generation, a generation that is going to be even more committed to God than we are, and is going to usher in the return of Jesus. Let's support our kids, let's encourage them, let's appreciate them, and let's prepare them for the role that God has for them in the generation to come. And, uh, and they're filling that role already. And uh, we want to let you know that we have a couple things coming up here a couple, in the next couple of Sabbaths. Next Sabbath will be Pastor George L. Lee, uh, our ministerial director for the Alberta Conference, and if you haven't heard, Pastor Ali is actually retiring from that role at the end of the year. So this will likely be his last time here in Airdrie Church. He served the Alberta Conference in that role for at least 10 years. I'm not sure how long it is, but I've been in Alberta for 10 years, and he's been in that role the whole time. And we really appreciate his dedication to that role and the way that he works with and supports us as pastors. They have... Um, they have announced the new ministerial director. Has anybody heard? Who's taking over? Tyler Rosenglen. He is uh, currently in the um, Sylvan Lake, thank you, in the Sylvan Lake Church as the pastor of Sylvan Lake. So he'll be transitioning into that role in uh, January, starting January 1st. So hopefully you'll be here to s enjoy Pastor Ali's ministry one last time to the Airdrie Church and wish him well into retirement. We also want to let you know the Sabbath after that is our International Sabbath. Um, we, do you remember that last year? We did it in October last year. It was a real blessing. And so we're doing it uh, in two weeks from now. We're going to do our International Sabbath. Um, Sister Lulu is leading out in that, and she wants you to know that we have four countries who have rep are being represented, have agreed to participate in that, but she's looking for more. So if you would like to step up and uh, have your country represented in some way, during that service, just please let Lulu know. She would be happy to involve as many uh, countries as possible in that. So please uh, let her know if that is of interest to you. And uh, just one more plug for the business meeting coming up in two weeks. We're going to talk about the potlucks and try to make some plans going forward as to how we can best facilitate potlucks in our church here. And uh, we're, that's going to be followed by a games night, by the way. How many of you like to play games? Not in church, right? You just like to play games. We, uh, we're going to plan a games night so we can do the hard work of a business meeting, discuss an issue that we have in our church that we want to settle, 
and then we can have some fun together. Let all the stress go, play games. What's on the menu? Like food-wise? <laughs> Whatever you bring, Camille. <laughs> we haven't actually worked that part of it out yet, but we will have at least some snacks there. We'll have at least some snacks there. So I hope you'll be able to attend that if you're a um, baptized member of our church. And if you're not a baptized member of our church, you can come to the games night afterwards. We'll send you a text when we're done discussing that issue, and then we'll uh, invite you to come out and join us. Okay, so we are uh, on part four of our sermon series on the book of Job, looking at suffering and why that happens in our world and how we should relate to that as Christians, as followers of God, how we can relate to our own suffering and the suffering of the people around us. So a quick review again, because some people might not know what we've been talking about. So we talked about Job and how the Bible presents Job as a righteous, godly, highly committed follower of God who was a, a wonderful influence in his family, spiritual leader in his family, a wonderful influence in the community that he lived in, a tremendous blessing to everybody around him. But one day, out of the blue, disaster strikes his life. Chaos comes in every form, and he is just, his life is just shambles all of a sudden. He loses his income, he loses his assets, he loses his family, all of his children he loses. He loses his health, and then eventually he loses his reputation as people are misunderstanding what has happened to this man. And so he it goes through this disaster, and everybody wonders what happened. Why has this happened? And for us as readers of the book of Job, we get to see the curtain pulled aside and understand that it is Lucifer, the enemy of mankind, who is behind the sufferings of Job. He has brought all this on. Because he's come into the presence of God, into a heavenly council, and he's challenged the character of God over Job, accusing God of showing favoritism to Job, protecting him from any harm and any disasters in his life, and accusing God of doing this, and this is why Job is such a highly committed follower of his. And he challenges God and says, if you will remove your protection from Job and allow me to have access to his life, he will curse you. He will walk away from you and turn his back on you completely. So God allows this to play out under the rules of the great controversy. He has to allow Lucifer limited access to the life of Job, and he brings these disasters to him. But unlike Lucifer predicted, Job does not turn his back on God, Instead, we find him worshiping God after going through these disasters. And just like the song that our brother sang for us today, he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. An incredible act of faith that we see in the response of Job. But as time goes on, we see that the reality of his losses begin to set in for him, and Job begins to go through the normal grieving process that we would expect from somebody who's had such tremendous losses. He begins to feel despondent and feel despair, and he feels anger. And all of this comes out in uh, the conversations that he has with his three friends who show up at this point and begin talking to him. Well, they don't begin talking to him. They begin supporting him initially by not saying anything, just sitting by him and being uh, uh, a support to him in the silence of their presence there. But once Job starts to talk, his three friends just blow it completely and they start accusing Job and blaming him for his own trials and difficulties, saying that he must be some kind of a secret sinner or something in order to go through this stuff because they, like Job and everybody else, were operating under the theological uh, proposition that bad things only happen to bad people. So because of that, Job must really be a bad person, not the kind of person that he presented himself to be. And they go after him, and they harass him, and they accuse him, and they try to get him to confess some secret sin that they believe he's holding in his life. Well, you can imagine the effect that this had on Job. He uh, becomes more and more upset as the conversation progresses. For Job, he believes that God made a mistake because he's operating under the same premise. 
Bad things only happen to bad people. He knew he wasn't a bad person. So God's made a mistake in his case. But as the conversation continues and his friends continue to harass him, Job becomes more and more upset and begins blaming God for his situation. Not just saying he made a mistake, but saying that he isn't listening to what God is saying. He's not willing to talk to Job about it. God's not willing to talk to Job about it. And Job becomes bold and sarcastic and even taunting God in the way that he is communicating about him and toward him. And it's at this point that we come to understand that there is a fourth friend who is there. There's five of them all together. This is a young man by the name of Elihu. He hasn't said anything up to this point because he's younger than the other three friends and he's deferring to them. But when the three friends give up on Job because they can't convince him that he's a sinner, then Elihu begins to step forward and speak to Job. And he's upset with the three friends. He's not impressed with the way that they have been accusing Job with no basis for it, no evidence to support it. But he's also uh, uh, um, shocked by some of the things that he's hearing coming out of Job's mouth as well. And he recognizes the dangerous path that Job is heading down, that he's about to walk off of a cliff spiritually. He's about to give in to what the devil said Job would do. He is about to turn his back on God. And like a true friend, Elihu hollers out to him to try to rescue him from certain disaster. And what's fascinating about the interchange between Elihu and Job is that it's not really an interchange at all because Job says absolutely nothing back to Elihu. He just sits there quietly and listens to what Elihu is saying because in all likelihood, he thinks that perhaps Elihu is right in what he's saying. And he's reconsidering his own position. And so that's where we're picking it up today. Job chapter 37 and verse 1, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. Job 37 and verse 1, we are going to look at the end of the conversation of Elihu's speech, we should say, at the end of Elihu's speech, and what happens following that. Job chapter 37 and verse 1. There's been six chapters here in the book of Job that Elihu has been speaking And now he is wrapping things up. Job 37, starting in verse 1. Elihu says, At this my heart pounds and leaps from its place. Listen, listen to the roar of his voice, to the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He's speaking of God. He unleashes his lightning beneath the whole heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. After that comes the sound of his roar. He thunders with his majestic voice. When his voice resounds, he holds nothing back. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. While these men are talking together, let me remind you that they are sitting outside together. They're sitting outside And uh, they see off in the distance that a storm is approaching them. A huge storm in the desert is kicking up all kinds of dust, big clouds, lightning is seen there. This storm is approaching. What Elihu understands from this storm that the rest of the group has not picked up on yet is that in this storm, God is approaching them. God himself is coming to get involved in the conversation that has been happening between Job and his friends. He's coming to say his peace. He's coming because Job has invited him to come there. Many times during Job's conversation with his three friends, he says that he wishes that he could get an audience with God. He wishes that he could speak to God and explain to him the mistake that he has made And straighten things out. Get God to straighten out the mess and remove all of this from Job. Here's an example of Job doing this back in uh, Job chapter 13, starting in verse 20. This is uh, Job speaking directly to God. Only grant me these two things, O God, and then I will not hide from you. First, withdraw your hand far from me and stop frightening me with your terrors. Then, two... Summon me and I will answer, or let me speak and you reply. Job is inviting God to speak to him, to talk with him about what has happened here. 
and he's giving him two options. He's giving him two options. Either you can talk to me and and then uh, first, and then I will answer you, or you come here and I'll talk to you, and then you can reply and explain what's going on to me. Job has been requesting the presence of God in this conversation, and God is honoring that request by making his presence felt through this thunderstorm. Here we hear for the first time the voice of God in this story. Job 38, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Who is he talking about? Job. These comments are directed to Job. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. So God shows up, and he chooses option A. He's going to speak first, and then Job is going to answer him afterwards. So God begins to speak with Job. This is what Job has been asking for, and God is honoring that request. He is going to talk to Job first, and then Job is going to answer him afterwards. Now, God goes into a long monologue from this point on in chapter 38. He goes into a long monologue about the creation. It's really fascinating some of the things that God says in here. He's talking about the process of creation as well as the creation itself and how it exists at that point in time. And he goes back to things like he's talking about the foundations of the earth and how the earth was designed originally and how it was hung in space, the perfect distance from the sun, and how it was created, was able to sustain life, and how God designed all of that. And he asks Job at this point, and, and throughout this conversation, or this monologue, he asks Job over and over again, were you there to see this? Do you understand how this works? Have you had any part in designing what I'm talking about? These are questions that God keeps asking Job as he goes through this. And he carries on talking about the creation, um, looking at how God separated the waters above from the waters below and brought dry land and created boundaries, barriers for the ocean so that it could only go so far. How God designed the earth and its atmosphere, its ecosphere that we live in today. He talks about the sun and the moon and the stars and how they're set up to provide what was necessary for the earth, keeping seasons and times. He goes on to talk about elements like darkness and light and the important role they play in sustaining life on this earth. He even talks about the snow, something that we know lots about here in Alberta, right? We know lots about the snow. It's on its way. There's lots going on in Lake Louise today, apparently. But the snow is on its way. We're familiar with the snow. We know what it's like. But God brings the snow up. Job wouldn't be that familiar with it. But he brings up the snow, he, uh, he talks about the whole water system that God created on this earth to sustain life, the whole cycle of precipitation. Then he takes Job off the earth, out into the universe, he talks about the stars, the constellations, uh, the solar systems. He says, Job, do you know how these things work? Do you have any part in making these things and designing them? And then he, uh, he then goes back to the earth, he starts talking about the animals here on the earth and how they uh, take care of themselves, and how they perpetuate themselves, generation after generation after generation. How the lion finds food for its young, how the raven will feed its young, and take care of its young, and raise them into adulthood. They, all, they do all this without any intervention from human beings, without any guidance from the human population. He talks about the mountain goat, and how it gives birth, all on its own out there in the wilderness. No midwife to help it gives birth, and this goes on and on thousands and thousands of times every day, millions of times every year, animals perpetuating their species generation after generation. He talks about the wildlife that barely interacts with human beings at all, the the wild donkey, the wild horses, the hawks, and the eagles. God is talking about the creation in this way. What is his point in doing this? What, what's he trying to say to Job? Well, he's try, a couple of things he's trying to do. He's trying to expand Job's horizons. He's showing just how vast and intricate the creation is. 
just how powerful and amazing the world that we live in and the universe that our world exists in really is. He's trying to expand Job's thinking, his understanding, because as is fitting, it's good to do that for people when we get into difficulties and we start to experience some serious troubles in our lives, often we become fixated on those problems and we forget that there's an entire universe out there all around us. And God is trying to help Job to see beyond his own problem to the things that are happening around him. The second thing that I believe God is trying to get across to Job in sharing all of this with him, reminding him of all of this, is just how, as I mentioned, how vast and intricate this universe is, is an indication that whoever brought this into existence must be extremely intelligent and powerful compared to human beings. The one who brought this into existence and who is able to sustain this magnificent system that we have in our universe must be somebody very powerful and very intelligent. And basically God is saying, so why are you questioning my ability to handle this? Why are you questioning my ability to handle this? So now it's Job's turn to answer. God's spoken, Job chapter 40 and verse 1. If you want to go there, we'll hear Job's response to what God said. Job chapter 40 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. And then we get Job's answer in verse 3. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Job doesn't know what to say. He's heard God, God speak, and he doesn't know how to answer him. Job has been putting himself on an equal footing with God by accusing God of making a mistake and of being unfair to him. Job has been putting him on a level himself on a level with God. He's saying, I want to sit across the table from God and I want to advise him on how he could be doing a better job in my situation and maybe in the world at large. He's setting himself equal or perhaps even above God in the way that he has been approaching the problem that he's having. But now, as he's heard God speak and given him a tour of the universe, and maybe God even showed Job in vision some of the things he was talking about. We're not sure. But now that he's had listened to God speak, Job has nothing to say. He's ashamed. He's embarrassed by what he has said and how he has related to God through this difficulty that he's been, gone, been going through. But God's not finished with Job yet. He has more to say to him. In Job chapter 40 and verse 6, the conversation carries on. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Just like he said before. Verse 8, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's, and can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor, and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at every proud man and bring him low. Look at every proud man and humble him. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you, that your own right hand can save you. God is saying to Job, listen, there's a huge mess in this world, in this creation that I made. There's a huge mess right now. The sin problem has come in and done a lot of damage in this world. And it's made it very complicated to figure out how to manage it. Can you show me how this whole thing should be managed? Can you, by your own power, look after all the problems in this world and in this universe? Can you distinguish between the righteous and the ungodly? Can you deal with the sin problem and bring it all to an end by your own power? The obvious answer to that question is no, right? 
He can't do this. God is trying to help Job see where he was headed with the things that he was saying. Now, it's important at this point to to say that God is not trying to bully Job here. He's not trying to intimidate Job into being quiet and forgetting about the whole thing. He's not doing that to Job. What he's doing, he is trying to help Job gain a new perspective, to get a better perspective on what's happening, not just in his own life, but in the bigger picture of things. You remember last time we said that when we shake our fist at heaven and begin to blame God for what sin and the devil is doing in our lives, we've lost perspective. We're not seeing things clearly anymore. And God is, through his conversation with Job, trying to help him to clarify things, trying to help him to see clearly what is really going on and to put things back into perspective again. And so God continues to talk to Job, and now he is going to talk to him at length about two specific creatures that were on the earth at that time. One is the behemoth. It was the largest land creature at that time. And the other is Leviathan, the largest sea creature at that time. God begins at length to describe these two creatures and talk about them to Job for a purpose. For a purpose. Now, many people who uh, look at this think that probably this is just talking about the hippopotamus and the crocodile. But when you read the descriptions about these two creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan, there's no way that they could be applying to those animals, at least not the way they operate today. And you'll see that as we go through this a little bit. This is something more than just what we are see on the earth today. This is something from antiquity, some animals from antiquity that probably are not around today. I will show you an artist's conception of these creatures, okay? So here, first of all, is Behemoth, the largest land animal. Based on the descriptions that are given in Job, this is what an artist believed it probably looked like. Quite a large creature. Looks like a dinosaur, doesn't it? Maybe there were some dinosaurs around when Job was around. It's hard to say. Maybe that's why we are finding bones of such large animals. But this is likely, based on the description, what the Behemoth looked like. Now, the Leviathan, I'm going to show you a picture of that too. But I want to prepare you for this. You might want to cover your eyes, children. It's kind of scary looking, okay? So you're prepared for it. Here's an artist's conception of the Leviathan based on the description in the book of Job. What an incredibly large and scary looking creature. Let me take you through some of the descriptors in the book of Job. You can see why an artist would draw that creature like that. Here's what God says in chapter 41. I will, not to fail, I will not fail to speak of his limbs, his strength, and his graceful form. Who dares open the doors of his mouth, ringed about with his fearsome teeth? His back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. His snorting throws out flashes of light. His eyes are like the rays of dawn. Firebrands stream from his mouth, sparks of fire shoot out, smoke pours from his nostrils as from a boiling pot over a fire of reeds. His breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from his mouth. I've never seen a crocodile do that, but how about you? That doesn't sound like a crocodile. Further, he says, he makes the depths churn like a boiling cauldron and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him, he leaves a glistening wake. One would think the deep had white hair. Nothing on earth is his equal, a creature without fear. He looks down on all that are haughty. He is king over all that are proud. Just this magnificent and terrifying creature that God is describing here. And here's the point of what God is saying by bringing up Leviathan and Behemoth in this next passage. This is what he says to Job. Can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he keep begging you for mercy? If you lay a hand on him, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. (laughs) 
Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. This is quite the creature that God is describing here, isn't it? God, this is what God is saying will happen to you if you encounter this creature out in the wilderness. You are going to be absolutely terrified and you won't know what to do. You'll be crying for your mommy. You'll be terrified. You'll be scared. But God goes on to say that while no human being can manage this creature or defend themselves against it, there is someone who can. In Job 40, verse 19, this is speaking of Behemoth, but the same thing applies to both creatures. He ranks first among the works of God, yet his maker can approach him with the sword. So no human being can manage Leviathan or Behemoth, but God can manage them because he is their maker. In other words, he can subdue them no matter how violent and scary they may actually be. God is speaking to Job about these two creatures, and he's using them in a symbolic way in his conversation. Job was familiar with these creatures, and he was familiar with the mythological status that they had taken on in the pagan religions that surrounded him. You see, in the Canaanite religion, the Leviathan and the Behemoth had taken on this mystical, mythological quality and assigned to them were things that probably they really couldn't even do in reality, no matter how big and powerful they were. The Leviathan in particular was considered to be a supernatural evil being who would go about uh, creating chaos in the lives of human beings. And the only person who could control him would be one of the gods. They would have to call on one of the gods to subdue and control this creature of Leviathan. And Job would have been familiar with this religious understanding. He didn't ascribe to it. He didn't believe in it and agree with it. But he was familiar with it. He knew the quality that these creatures had taken on in the minds of some people. Job even mentions Leviathan early in the book of Job when he's talking about his anguish of heart and wishing that he hadn't even been born, wishing that his birthday could be wiped out completely. He references Leviathan. This is in Job 3 verse 8. May those who curse days curse that day those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. There is a belief among the Canaanites that Leviathan had the power to block out the sun and to block out the moon and to make a day as if it didn't exist at all. So Job is referencing this. He doesn't believe it himself. He says, may those who curse days. He's not talking about himself, but he's just expressing his anguish in terms of wishing that this day could be done away with. So Job was very familiar with the Leviathan. He understood what God was trying to get across. He understood God's message. You see, there's people, sometimes we think that God never said anything to Job about what we see at the beginning of the book. Some, he's saying that some people feel that he never said anything. Why didn't he just say, you know what, there's a, a, this other being, this person called Satan, who's challenged me about your life, and he's going to bring misery into your life for a while, and then I'm going to straighten everything out, but don't worry, you know, just hang on tight. Why didn't God say that to him? Why didn't he explain that to him? But we can see from what God is saying about Leviathan and how Job's understanding of it would have been that God is actually saying this to Job. He's saying to Job, there is a supernatural being in your life who is creating this havoc. It's not coming from me. It's coming from him, but you can't do anything about it because he's too powerful for you to deal with. I'm the only one who can manage this, and I know when to bring it under control and bring it to an end. This is the message that God is getting across to Job, and Job would have understood this. Job would have picked this up from what God is saying here about Leviathan and Behemoth. Leviathan appears in other places in the Old Testament as well. In Psalm 74, verses 12 to 14, I want to show you this. This is really fascinating. So here's a passage from Psalm 74, verses 12 to 14, that mentions Leviathan. But you, O God, are my king from of old. You bring salvation upon the earth. It was you who split open the sea by your power. 
You broke the heads of the monster in the waters. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan and gave him as food to the creatures of the desert. Notice it's crushed. Remember where that word first appeared? Crushed the heads. Crushed the heads of Leviathan. Notice it's plural, not just singular. The heads of Leviathan. Now, the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, but it was translated or just before Jesus' time into Greek because everybody was speaking Greek by then. And that Greek translation of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint. You've heard of that before? The Septuagint. And in the Septuagint, the translation from Hebrew into Greek, this is what this one phrase I'm going to show you in particular says. Here's the Greek for it. It says, Tas kephalas to drakontos. Do you recognize that last Greek word there? Drakontos. How about drakon? Change the K to a G. It's dragon. It's where we get our word dragon today. The description sounds like a dragon, the fire breathing, and the shields tightly together. In every case where Leviathan appears in the Old Testament, except for one, it is translated into Greek by the word drakontos or dracon, which is where we get our English word dragon. The Leviathan of the Old Testament is the dragon. And that dragon reappears again in the New Testament in the symbolic prophecy of the book of Revelation. And notice that it's multi-headed in the book of Revelation. Here's what it says in Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dracon, dragon, with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Who is this? We understand who it is. The great dracon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. This is none, the Leviathan is none other than than Lucifer himself, the enemy of God and the enemy of all mankind. And God is communicating this to Job, and Job understands in some limited form what God is saying to him. And God's message to Job in this is, listen, this is more than you can manage. I am on the case. I know what's going on. I've set boundaries for him, and this will come to an end. But in the meantime, you need to just trust me. Just like Gianna talked about last week. You need to just trust me. Just trust me through your trials and difficulties. I have got this under control. It's understandable why Job got so upset. We all want suffering to come to an end, don't we? We all want suffering to come to an end. Not just our own suffering, but suffering out there in the world as well. There's nothing we would like more than to bring suffering to an end. We see it in the world around us, the conflict in the Ukraine, what's happening between Israel and Hamas, and how innocent people in Palestine and Israel both are getting killed by what's happening there, this conflict that's taking place there. We see mass shootings still happening in North America. We see people going through terrible losses in their life. There's nothing more that we would like than to bring that suffering to an end. And this has been the cry of the human heart all down through history. Why can't the suffering be over? Why can't God do something about this suffering? Habakkuk, one of God's prophets, at the beginning of his book in Habakkuk 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, this is what he said. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Doesn't he sound like Job? How long... Must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Have you ever felt that way when you turn on the news or go on the internet? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. We would love to see suffering come to an end. And sometimes we ask God, why are you tolerating this? Why are you allowing this to go on? You know, truth be told, we all have a little bit of, bit of advice that we'd like to give to God, don't we? A little bit of advice on how things are going in this world, maybe in our world in particular or the world in general. We'd like to say to God, you know, if you could just alter this, tinker with this a little bit, remove some of the suffering 
You know, the children, God, don't let the children get hurt in this world. We all have some advice for God on this issue of suffering, but God is not open to our advice because we can't see things the same way that he sees things. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 40 says. <clears throat> who has instruct, or who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge and showed him the path of understanding? This is where Job was going. I need to straighten God out here. He's made a mistake on my life. And sometimes we feel this way as well. If we could just talk to God and get it all straightened out, then we wouldn't have to go on with the suffering that we're going on with. But God isn't open to our advice. He loves to hear our prayers, and he wants to see and hear our expressions of anguish and our requests to him for other people and for the relief from suffering that we have in our own lives. But he's not open to us taking the position of the upper hand and advising him on what he should do. It should always be, nevertheless, my, you, nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. That's how we need to approach this. But God is not open to that advice because God is the only one who can see the big picture. He's the, on, he's the only one smart enough to know what the best path is to choose. And he's the only one who can manage Leviathan. He's the only one that can control this supernatural being that is wreaking havoc in the lives of humans, and he's the only one that knows when it's time to bring it all to an end. Our scripture reading today contained the verse, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is why God is willing to tolerate suffering on this planet, because he wants to save as many people as possible. And that may include some people in this room today who have not yet made the decision for Jesus in their life. God is willing to tolerate injustice and suffering in this world so that one more person can give their lives to him and become part of he, his eternal kingdom. And he's calling you and I to be willing to endure suffering as well for the sake of those who have not yet made a decision for Jesus. He's going to bring this all to an end in his time. But in the meantime, we need to just keep trusting him and following him. We need to surrender our lives completely to him. You know, when I was in Berman University, I have another Berman story for you. When I was at Berman University, I took a class called Issues in Science and Religion. And it was a class for, especially for theology majors, to look at some of the relationship between science and religion, science and theology, and to talk about some of the issues that exist in that realm. And uh, part of the curriculum was that we took a three-day trip, or we take a three-day trip up into the mountains to go look at firsthand at the evidence that is used to support the theory of evolution and understand better how to relate to that evidence. And so we took a, a trip up there, it was part of our curriculum, but in that particular year that I was, took that class, there was a lot more students than there normally is. And usually they would use a 15-passenger van to do that trip. A teacher would drive and we'd all ride in it. But there were more than 15 of us in the class. And so they also, the college also owned at that time a car that was used to do airport runs to deliver students back and forth to the airport. And I was one of the drivers who would do that while I was working there, uh, going to school there. I was working doing that. And so the teachers asked me if I would be willing to drive that car. I was insured to drive that car. Would I drive that car on the trip so that the rest of the students, the overflow from the van, could ride there? So I said, sure, that's no problem. So I did that, and we took off on our trip, and we traveled uh, to Jasper and down the Banff Jasper Highway and down to southern Alberta and looked at all kinds of interesting things. There was a lot of driving you know, on that trip there, and as we continued to drive there, all I had to do was follow the van. That was my only responsibility. And the van led the way, and I just followed along where it went. And we just kind of relaxed and talked and chatted on the whole way there, the four of us who were in the car. 
So uh, at different points during the trip, when we would stop, one of the teachers would come up to me and say, how are you doing? Are you okay? Are you tired? Because there's a lot of driving, right? And I would say, you know, I'm fine. It's, it's really easy to drive when you don't have to make the decisions, when you leave it up to something else, when all I have to do is follow. I didn't have to look at a map. I didn't need to know where I was going. I didn't need to decide where, the, where we would turn off or where we would stop for the night. All I had to do was keep my eye on the van in front of me and follow. And it was very easy to do that. And that's true in our lives today. All we have to do is keep our eyes on Jesus and follow him. He knows the future. We don't. We can trust him to make the right decisions for us and to lead us in the right paths that we want to go. It's so much easier when you're not carrying the burden of the trip when you're really just along for the ride and you're letting God have control of your life, leaving everything with him, it makes things so much easier for us. That's what God is inviting us to do. I want to take you to one more passage. I know we've got, it's late here, but Job chapter 42 and verse 4. I just want to look at this quickly. We're going to talk about this more next time in our final sermon. But Job chapter 42 and verse 4. This is a passage that often confuses people in the book of Job. Something that happens at the end of of Job's conversation with God. Uh, Job chapter 42. Let me go there. Job chapter 42 and verse 2. Sorry, verse 4. Job chapter 42 and verse 4. This is now Job's final response to God. He says, You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, Job says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job repents at the end of the book. People sometimes say, why does Job repent? Very clearly at the beginning of the book of Job, it says that Job never sinned or did anything wrong in what he said or what he did. What is he repenting of? Well, Job is not repenting because his three friends were right and he had some secret sin in his life that he needed to get rid of. Job is repenting because of his attitude toward God as he went through that suffering. It's true that he was pushed to that limit by what his friends were saying, and we'll talk about that next time more, but he still accepted responsibility for the fact that he had allowed his attitude to get really bad toward God, and he's repenting of that attitude because he realizes that he had been accusing God unfairly for causing this suffering in his life. And what was it that led Job to repentance? What was it that happened to help Job to see clearly what was going on during that time? It's right there in uh, verse 5. Job says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. It was Job's personal encounter with God that opened up his eyes and allowed him to see things as they really were. It was a personal experience with him. In the past, Job had heard things about God, and he had formulated his understanding of God based on what he had heard and what he thought of himself. But now he had a personal experience with God, and it totally changed his perspective. And you and I need that same personal experience with Jesus. In order for us to understand our world correctly, in order for us to understand what God is doing in our lives, we need a personal experience with him. We can't just hear about God. We need to connect with God. We need the spirit of God living in us. And that only comes by spending time with God regularly in the word of God praying and watching the way he is working in our lives. As I said earlier, it's so much easy when you are not easier when you are not in the driver's seat. When you are allowed to be the one who is following. God is inviting us to simply follow him, to trust him, to leave our future and our past in his hands and to trust him even with every moment of every day as we go through this life. May God bless us as we put our hand in his and let him lead us day by day. Amen.
Amen. Uh, let us just stand as we sing our closing song. Under his wings I'm safely abiding. Though the night's deepens and tempest award, still I can trust him. I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me and I am his child. Under his wings under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings, my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under his wings, our refuge in sorrow, Often when heart has no balm for my healing, there I find comfort and there I am blessed. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings, my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under his wings, oh, what precious enjoyment, there will I hide till I strive the harm. Rest in Jesus and save evermore. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings, my soul shall abide. Safely abide forever. Father in heaven, we want to be under your wings. I know you long to gather us together as a mother hen gathers her chicks. Lord, it's a dangerous world out there, not just physically, but spiritually. There are many temptations and many misunderstandings that can lead us away from you, Lord. Please help us to keep, stay close to you, to keep you foremost in our lives, to put you first in everything that we do, Lord, that we may indeed be under your wings, safely abiding forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.